and welcome to another episode of Let's Keep Chatting. My name's Lisa and we have Elric today. We're from the Five Centre of Qualities. And today we have Stuart from uh, Pink Saltire. Hello. Hi, welcome. Hello, hello. <laughs> uh, Let's Keep Chatting is a podcast where we're chatting with community groups of organisations with um, that are helping people around Fife um, about what they are doing to help different equality groups with the, because, with the efforts, effects of poverty and also how they are coping with the current COVID-19 situation. Yeah, so uh, it's, it's a podcast, but you can also find us on YouTube and uh, that's quite handy. You can click on the closed captions and get subtitles that way. And uh, so we'll put all the links later on down the line. So, hi Stuart, uh, welcome today. Thanks for having me. Thanks. Um, to start off, you know, would you like to uh, explain to everybody uh, what your organisation well, is? Um, I'll give you a wee bit of a background. Since I'm the founder of Pink Saltire, I should know most about it, I guess. Um, so Pink Saltire is an organisation it's an LGBT charity, so all of our work is focused on improving the lives of lesbian, gay, bisexual and trans people uh, all over Scotland, uh, specifically for this podcast. It's about Fife and we're based in Fife. Uh, I'm a proud Fife, I grew up in Cowdenbeath uh, and now live in Dunfermline. So we started, we registered as a, an organisation back in 2014 um, and really we, we started with the aim of trying to understand exactly what differences there were between uh, the city life of LGBT people, which often is talked about and, and, and is often the focus of some of the big national organisations uh, like Stonewall and LGBT Youth and Equality Network, and what the differences were for people like us in more rural uh, and suburban areas of Scotland. And there were a number of differences actually, and we wanted to make sure that our voices and our experiences uh, were talked about and were raised at a senior level in government and with stakeholders. So we decided that since there was a bit of a gap actually for people like us, but also people on the islands and, and in much more rural places outside of the central belt, to try and set up an organisation to do just that, to promote the voices of people from those types of areas. So as I say, we registered in 2014. So God, it's went fast, it's about six years now, six years, yeah. over six years. <laughs> um, we had our first real project actually in 2015. We did a lot of work to try and understand what the, the needs of the community were, first of all. So we knew what our experiences were, but we wanted to make sure that, um, you know, some of those similar themes, um, you know, ran across other areas and, and, and not just in Fife. So we undertook a number of kind of research projects in, in, in 2015, and that led us to our first public project, I guess, in 2016, which was around uh, short films. And we've always had, uh, I guess, a, a real passion for, for media. So I have a journalism background, that's um, what I trained in. And, and I think, you know, telling people's stories and, and new technology allows us to tell people's stories in different ways. So we've always been really keen on embracing new technology, embracing the, the tools that social media has brought us for as much as it has its, its evils as well. It's, it's actually been good at bringing people together. And, and so in 2016, we launched a project called the Pink Saltire Originals, which was a series of short films, actually, that were uh, shot by LGBT people, and it was about LGBT issues. Uh, I remember those are great. <laughs> yeah, we, you, can you remember us? Actually, I think you were involved Pink, in some of those first Pink films. Pink Kingdom, yeah, yeah, I remember Pink Kingdom. So, Is it still available somewhere? Could people yeah, yeah, we have a YouTube right? channel with all of that information on it. And, and Queer Kingdom, as, as Eric says, was one of the first films that we produced. And that was really to try and highlight what life was like for LGBT people here in Fife. Uh, and we, we highlighted a number of different people um, in that short film. And one of the people was um, a trans woman called Tish. And she has been, uh, you know, a real stalwart of, of LGBT education and uh, trans inclusion in Fife, has been involved in a number of FCE initiatives and initiatives with Pink Saltire. Uh, and in fact, they've, they've been encouraged and supported to start their own transgender Fife group uh, in the last couple of years as well, which has gone on to, to great success. So we, we had the, the film project and there were a, a few different topics that were challenged there, not just uh, the experiences of people in rural communities, 
at the time, the debate around inclusive education had just started, uh, and we mm. did a film with the Thai yeah. campaign to really highlight what their uh, objectives were and to push forward the the aim of inclusive education in Scotland schools at that time. That was before we had, you know, a majority of, of Scottish MSPs supporting it. Um, we also did some work, uh, very early work, with the Scottish Trans Alliance on promoting the gender recognition campaign to make sure that trans people were recognised uh, in, the, in the law and that especially around trans health care there were mm -hmm. improvements or at least a highlight uh, a kind of spotlight shone on the difficulties that trans people experience and, and still do in uh, achieving equality in health care so those were some of the very first types of projects that we started and since then you know we've we've i guess gone out with that objective of continuing to promote voices from different diverse backgrounds within that umbrella of lgbt um, you know, we've we've we run a, a news site at pinksaltair.com with all of the kind of latest LGBT headlines and, and kind of stories that are, are breaking around the country, and and a real focus on community development. Our focus, I guess, our aim has always been to promote LGBT voices, not just from the big cities like Edinburgh and Glasgow. And so it's important to highlight some of the work that's already going on. You wouldn't know that there was, you know, LGBT groups in every corner of Scotland and lots mm -hmm. of the islands now. And a, and a real example of how that has changed has probably been in Pride. Mm -hmm. So back in 2015, uh, when we first started uh, our, our very first first project. There were only three Pride events in Scotland, Edinburgh and Glasgow, and there was one in a small one in Livingston. Yeah, they took over. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And, and, and those are big events. They attracted thousands and thousands of people from all over the country um, to come and attend. But we thought, well, why is there not one for lots of different communities? You know, why don't we have one in Kirkcaldy or in Dundee and some of the other places? And um, we started to discuss that with community partners, including FCE, uh, here in Fife. And we got together and sat down and decided that, you know, that was the last year that there wouldn't be a Fife Pride. We were going to do something about that. And so in 2016, we held um, an event at uh, the Carnegie Centre in Dunfermline, which was supposed to be really a, an opportunity, a chance for LGBT people from all over Fife to come together and celebrate some of their achievements and celebrate some of the great work that's going on. And that was the night that we, uh, both Pat and I, stood on stage and announced that we were going to try and plan the very first Fife Pride, <laughs> which uh, was probably more <laughs> ambitious than we'd expected at that time, I think. Um, uh, you had people who didn't believe that it was going to work out, no, I remember, yeah. Yes. There, was, there was actually, you know, quite a quite a fair bit of um, controversy around it. You know, lots of people saying this is not something that we want here in Fife, you know, um, mm. the, the usual haters on social media saying this will never work. You'll never get, you know, Kirkcaldy or Dunfermline or any place like that to embrace LGBT equality and in, to embrace an event like Pride. Mm -hmm. But uh, through through hard work and determination um, and through ambition, you know, I think that's that's a really understated word. You, you, you have to have that ambition to to make some of these first time events and, and, and uh, initiatives happen. Mm -hmm. So with with uh, Fife Centre for Equalities, we we put on the very first Fife Pride event in uh, July 2017. And. All of our planning, I mean, as much as we, the effort that we put in, and there was a huge amount of effort from a, a team of volunteers to make it happen, we thought we'd maybe get five or six hundred people coming along. And uh, on the on the first day, that was the 4th of July, then we had three and a half thousand people attend that very first Pride event. And from then it was like, OK, wow, this is a much bigger event than we'd expected. We need to do a lot more planning and, and <laughs> make sure it kind of sustains for the future. But it's it's grown ever since then and it's become its own entity. You know, it's got its own little committee and everything now that, that organised that. And I think that's that's really helped inspire other parts of the country to do their own thing because they said just like we did if Livingston can do it if Edinburgh and Glasgow have one and they're so successful why can't we mm -hmm. so growing from that Fife event in 2018 I think there were 11 Pride events that, sec that year after uh, last year in 2019 there were 21 events and before right. Covid struck this year there were plans for 27 different Pride events all over Scotland so it's definitely a movement that's Burgeoning Absolutely. And, and foreign crew and well, COVID did stop a lot, a lot of those, but yeah, so it's definitely picking up what across Scotland. And it's and it's really just about kind of pricking that confidence, making sure that people are aware that there's 
there's other people like them in their community and that they're not a you know a silent minority actually they can come together and get organized and they've got the skills and the expertise and with a little bit of backup from from us or from other organizations around the country they can do it and the, the, there's a, a network out there that can that, that can support them and make sure that it happens and that you know for us pride is it's a bit of a jumping off point actually pride is for us something that that blossoms uh, you know because of other events around the rest of the year yes it's a big very visual event in, in maybe the middle of the high street or, or, or a town centre um, but actually you know the, the stuff that comes with pride through the rest of the year is just as important mm -hmm. it's 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 a starting off point I think for lots of communities and you can see that um, in Perthshire so we did a community consultation there uh, just after Fife Pride actually at the end of 2017 to make sure that there was you know, some discussion about what um, LGBT people wanted to see in their community in Perthshire. And, you know, they, they were able to start up their very first Pride the following year. It's gone from success to success. It's, it's a huge big event. They had, um, you know, the, the actor Sir Ian McKellen leading their parade last year. Uh, so the <laughs> Gandalf had returned to the, sh the Shire. They had a, a world. They had a world record for the biggest gaily event, which uh, you know I had never been to before. But it was a fantastic day, even though it was raining a little bit. Um, but it's they've actually started. You know, since that event, other meets. So they have you know a monthly social meet now. They have mm -hmm. LGBT History Month events. They've got uh, a much greater um, say and and, and uh, exposure to. Some of the funding that happens in Perth and Kinross and, and the support from council uh, has gone right. much, much better. So uh, that's an example just of, of how Pride is, is a starting point for some communities. So in some ways, that's, that, that's, that's your work. You're, you're, you're creating this uh, a movement, but you're creating um, a basically activity that actually people get more involved in social life, public life, for LGBT life, and celebrating that and making it more accessible in some ways rather than yeah. clumped around the usual Glasgow and Edinburgh, but actually a bit wider. And obviously, well, we're, we're going to blow the trumpet for five because of course. <laughs> from that thing here and that's where we are. But basically, it's it's that. It's creating uh, the social life and uh, being active in, pub in public participation, not talked away at one event a year, mm -hmm. but actually be part of, of a fabric. So, uh, and that, they, they absolutely, mm -hmm. absolutely have to be. I, you know, I see the, the, the work of organisations um, like ours and like FCE has, has really been about community enabling. You know, the, the people of our communities have the skills and have the experience required to, to put these types of events on or to, to organise themselves into to groups. So uh, I think sometimes it just takes a little bit of a push and, a, you know, a bit of a confidence boost to say, it can be done. Look at other areas. You know, here's some support from us. Here's some practical guidance. Here's some help with funding applications. But actually, you know how to do this. You know you can do it yourself. Here you go. Go on and uh, and, and get on with it. And then COVID happened a bit. You know, right? <laughs> yes. <laughs> so after a hugely successful year last year, when we had um, a few different projects last year, um, we started a new three-year project uh, with young people uh, called Through the Lens. We've been doing some training on filmmaking with with young people. Uh, as I say, twenty odd uh, Pride events last year. Um, we try and attend as many as we possibly can. I think we were at 19 different Pride events last year uh, and, and we were planning for an even bigger 2020 and this year would have been actually the 25th anniversary of the first Pride event happening in Scotland. So there was a lot of um, you know, plans around marking that celebration of 25 years. And then in March, obviously, we get the news about, about COVID. So our work has, has completely pivoted to, to more hardship relief and uh, supporting people through the last few months, which, you know, have been exceptionally difficult. Uh, you know, I've been in, um, a, a community volunteer for a number of years and I haven't seen um, the impact of, um, you know, trauma, of um, poor mental health, that, that COVID has brought to, to a number of people, certainly not just LGBT. And, and and although we've been you know working specifically with that community, we haven't turned anybody away that's that's required help. And and I can see that there's a significant impact across the board. Fair enough. So how are you coping with everything because of COVID nineteen? That, that's you. As a founder uh, in Pink Saltire, but it's how Pink Saltire is coping as well. You know your volunteers, your staff, how, how is it going? 
Um, I, well, I mean, we're only a, a, a small charity that's been around just for a few years, but the impact has been severe. Um, you know, we've had a significant loss of income, for example. So we would normally raise maybe over £25,000 across the summer, going on to all the different Pride events. We sell lots of merchandise and, and, and help Pride sell their own flags and T-shirts and everything. Um, so all of that's just gone overnight. Um, you know, working from home, like we were, we were talking about offline, um, has mm. been really difficult. I think everybody faces a challenge around just talking into your computer all day you know uh, you know for a job that can be home based it's, it's great that we still have have a position but um, oh, we've lost Lisa oh. <laughs> well never mind we'll continue anyway we'll shall continue we? that's why we're here <laughs> um yeah I, I mean it's it's been extremely difficult and, and I think the impact on people's mental health um you know is is really significant I've felt that myself I, I really don't enjoy just sitting on my own working from home um trying to organize stuff through a laptop but I, you know I much prefer getting out and seeing people I don't know about you it's pretty odd isn't it I mean a lot of people have talked about it said especially the first I think especially if, if you're meeting people daily and all the time the first month was just really what's going on and yeah. you know uh, tiredness. Oh, welcome back, back again. Lisa. Hey, welcome back. I'm in the bad area of connection at the moment. <laughs> uh, it's not good, isn't it? I mean, uh, but we're just saying that the first month that everyone was adapting to it, everyone was really tired, staring at at the screen, trying to communicate. You know how, how you, yeah. you relate to people, and nonverbal communication is a lot. You know, you, we especially just, when people don't have. Where some people didn't understand like teams or technology or yeah. zoom and just having to quickly get taught it to understand it oh. i think it's also about the you know as, as a leader you, you've also got to think about the other people that are around you not just the service users but mm -hmm. also your your volunteers and, and we don't have any paid staff at all and um, it's, it's all kind of sessional work that, that we're able to do through mm -hmm. the project so you know thinking about all of those freelancers and sessional staff that have worked for us in the past and how they're going to be uh, stuck. And I think, you know, even the government schemes, the self-employed were, were right at the bottom of the list in terms of help that they were able to get uh, much later into the process, which is frustrating for a lot of people. And, and some people still have no support. Have you have you managed to access any help? Because obviously you, you would have predictions on the type of uh, fundraising you would expect to do during, especially summer is, is a main like for most charities, some is that's where you really go out. That's where you meet people. That's when you you get those tickets sold and all that. So, uh, have you had uh, so support that you could access in terms of uh, that? Yeah. So, I mean, that that was one of the the angles that I was going to speak about. Was you know, although there's been you know a huge demand on services, and we've had to pause all of the projects that we had and look at different ways of delivering them digitally than than we had expected. Um, we've we've been able to access hardship funding, you know, and, and that's where our, our services have completely pivoted around really to um, to deliver services for those uh, on low incomes or those that have been made redundant that are already vulnerable. And there's, you know, lots of data out there about how, um, you know, people in the LGBT community face a number of challenges around mental health um, and, and have worse health outcomes pre-COVID anyway. Mm -hmm. So uh, I think we were already mm -hmm. at a disadvantage before before COVID came along and then the effects of lockdown. And we've actually been doing some work with uh, the National Lottery over the last three months called the Rainbow Responders Programme to try and mm -hmm. investigate and understand a bit more about LGBT people's experiences during lockdown and, and, and since. Um, and, and all of that, I think, has, has proven that, you know, yes, there's some immediate priorities and that's around hardship and making make sure people have the right amount of food and, and access to, um, you know, digital inclusion, uh, you know, digital devices or top ups or whatever else they, they, they need to keep them connected to the world that has all gone digital. Mm -hmm. But beyond that, actually, is, is the more frustrating part. So there's, there's a great investment of funds for third sector organisations right at the start and in, in kind of April, May time. Uh, but lots of that is very short term and very, um, well, in terms of funding value, is quite limited. So mm -hmm. we've been able to access a, a, a good amount of that, higher than our, our annual turnover for last year. So we've raised about £140,000 over the last uh, six to nine months. Mm -hmm. But 
most of it has to be spent within three months. Uh, most of it is not for paid permanent staff. It's about the, the relief that you're, you're relief providing. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, we've helped over 450 families or individuals uh, across Fife, across the rest of Scotland who are LGBT to get okay. through the last few months. But okay. that doesn't help our charity necessarily. We don't get anything out of that. You know, there's no funding that continues for us. In fact, that responders project that I was talking about just finished on the 31st of October. Tell a bit more about the types of uh, relief that you were doing. What, 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 what kind of uh, packages were you doing with families and people? Just say a bit more about that a bit. Yeah, of course. So, I, I mean, uh, very early in the the process of this this lockdown, we we knew that there would be you know, some real basic essentials that we'd have to um, try and support people with. So we were out there um, organising fresh fruit and veg deliveries for people here in Fife. Um, we organised mobile top-ups, food vouchers, uh, care packs. We made sure that people had digital devices where we could um, secure funding to provide them. And I think we're up to something like 60 odd different uh, laptops that we've been able to give out to people. So all of that support and, and, and help, you know, as well as just having somebody on the end of the phone, actually, sometimes, you know, that was what people have, have needed. And we've received some funding to, to allow us to expand that mental health service actually here in Fife, just to make sure that there's there's you know some counselling services available there's some one-to-one -one time with somebody that's that's a professional in, in mental health and well-being mm -hmm. um, because lots of the services that are out there aren't always LGBT specific so they don't always have a, an understanding of some of the issues um, that LGBT people might have might have faced and, and be presenting with mm -hmm. and, and also and this is part of the, the research actually that we've just finished. Um, there's a huge issue around trust amongst the LGBT community. You know, we have significantly poor experiences in education, for example, high number of people that are still bullied, high number of people that, that report and then don't get act, action on it at, at school. Um, increasing number of hate crimes against us as a community. It's the second highest um, you know, um, type of hate crime across Scotland. And this year is the ninth consecutive highest year for hate crimes against LGBT people. Mm -hmm. um, you know, when we have experiences with the police, despite, you know, significant efforts, and I have to applaud the police and, and Fife in terms of their engagement with the community, but still a number of people have very negative experiences with the police. And therefore our, our trust in public services to, de to deliver support that's specific to, to LGBT people's needs and, and you know, what, exemplified what, during the, the, the COVID crisis is what, extremely low. What, when you say negative experiences, is it a question of uh, not understanding what the reports are about or uh, what, what would you mean? Just a bit more. It can be about that. So, uh, I mean, in, in terms of hate crime, you know, we've um, we've worked with individuals who have been targeted in their communities, who've you know had stuff thrown at their windows, people shouting outside their doors, not able to, to go to the shops, um, and and don't really get the support and the the response from the, the the police service that they would perhaps have desired, and 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 it's a multi agency. You know support that we need to put around people like that. sometimes it's about housing sometimes it's um you know about health services and making sure that you've got access to the the support that you need um other times it's about agencies making sure that we go out and tackle this you know there's there's very little work actually to go out and tackle hate crime you know go to offenders and go to uh, other institutions where we see uh, the perpetrators of hate crime against minority communities mm -hmm. and tackle you know their views rather than it just be support around the individuals yes that's very important but mm -hmm. we also have to be seen to be do something about it otherwise the numbers just continue to go up and up and up every year so approach towards restorative justice and all. Okay. Absolutely, absolutely. Mm -hmm. And I think that's something that, that you know, Fife will at some point embrace. We're, we're perhaps behind some of the other areas uh, in terms of our focus on equalities. And I know that that's, that's particular, you know, FCE's um, priority. But I think at a political level, you know, we lack behind a number of different council areas in terms of having an equality spokesperson, for example, within the political parties, having a dedicated equalities lead um, from the administration, having, you know, Glasgow this week are looking at a locality plan for equalities. Mm -hmm. we, we haven't even started those kinds of types, of types of discussions here in Fife yet. We have seven geographical locality plans, but what about people who sit across those, those geographic boundaries? 
um, the, the locality plans to deal with LGBT people just in, uh, you know, leaving mouth area are not the same as the, the plan for Fife. So we mm -hmm. need to consider communities that don't sit within those natural geographical boundaries. And, and it comes, you know, as I'm very blunt about this, it comes down to budgets. It, it does come down to funding. Funding is based on those ge geographic locations and mm -hmm. need within those, those locations. But if we don't have a clear understanding of what communities of interest needs are, and they sit across boundaries, um, we're never going to be able to fund services for them. And, 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 you know, COVID is a prime example where lots of people from Fife access services in Edinburgh. Mm -hmm. When there's a travel ban and a lockdown, you can't get to those services, even if they were still open. So we have to address what the, the specific needs of all Fifers are and whether the, the, the structures that we have in place, whether they be political or administrative and strategic, actually work for all of us and, and minority communities, you know, in, in my experience, often fall through the cracks and, and, and don't have enough attention on what some of the, the challenges are for facing the community. So it's kind of not just, the locality level is, is very much service led and issues, but this is a bit more about whether communities of interest are, which spills over. So it's not just a locality boundary. It's not even a, a local authority boundary, as you say, it's actually, it's where people, so for instance, people that, that live in Dunfermline would work in Edinburgh, they got, they don't, they don't necessarily work to a boundary kind of approach of things. That's definitely something that's, that's worth discussing. That's why we got the forum for, but yeah, exactly. So yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and that's some work that, that, you know, Nina and I have been, have been pressing Fife Council on for a number of months now, and we're keen that there's, there's some movement there um, pretty soon. And, and I think, you know, you've got an administration that has supported, uh, you know, initiatives like Fife Pride and, and, and supported our work and, and the work that FCE do. Um, but we have to make sure that that's sustainable and addresses all of the needs of those communities rather than, you know, kind of lip service stuff. And I'm sure there are lots of people who, you know, want to do the right thing by equalities communities, often need the data and analysis and research. And we've done some of that work now with regards to LGBT people mm -hmm. that we can help provide them. But there still needs to be that will. And, and sometimes I feel that's the, the thing that, you know, oh, we're going to have to change these structures just because, you know, other people in, in minority communities are complaining about it. But actually, those are the people who we need to keep here in Fife and, and, and stop uh, migrating to, to the big cities just because the services are there. We should be able to keep all of the creative talents that we've got within Fife here in Fife and provide services for them and make sure that they feel welcome to stay here, whatever minority you're part of. So without any, well, let's not steal the thunder because I see your, your your report will be published soon, but is there anything that you'd like to point out from that that, that actually might come up a bit? Um, sure, yeah. So, I mean, we've, we've got some statistics. We asked lots and lots of different questions in the, the data. Um, so to give you an understanding of the methodology, we um, we had an online survey. So the, the, the Rainbow Responders Programme ran for three months. We, we basically had two strands of work. Uh, one was around professional development, so doing practical interventions so that people understand, uh, you know, tools to support their well-being and their mental health. And the other was to, to go out and do some research and a study into what the impacts have been, what the priorities for people are. And so we, we ran an online survey, a self-selected survey, as well as a number of focus groups and one-to-one and -one interviews. And the data has all been collated into, um, well, two reports. The first was a 30-day a interim review. And that was really to look at the structures that had supported people during the initial phase of lockdown. So who were the people that organised it? What did they organise? How was it funded? And what are the sustainable models for moving forward? And then at the end of the three months, uh, the report that's going to be published this week is, is really pulling together all of that information as well as the survey data. So we've got some really interesting statistics, for example, around employment. I know this is an area that a lot of um, stakeholders are really, are really interested in. So we asked, for example, uh, about the percentage of people employed as key workers. So this is a, a population that we need to protect. Um, they, you know, they work in our care sector, they work as the NHS, as, as um, key workers in our local services. Um, and on average, one in four LGBT people are key workers, which we had no understanding of before. And, and that's higher amongst the age 30 to 39 group 
uh, at 33%, a third of people aged 30 to 39, that are LGBT are somehow key workers. Wow. Those are new statistics. You know, that's, that's a view that we've not been able to have before. So that's social care in general? Or, yep, 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 health services, councils, mm -hmm. uh, police, etc. Okay. Um, we've we've asked around uh, questions about self-employment. So, you know, a number of people uh, are self-employed across the country. The average for LGBT people was about 7.5%. However, people that are over 50, it was much higher. 12% of the over 50s have their own business. Uh, and people, obviously, this research was all about the whole of Scotland. Uh, people on the islands, 18% uh, of LGBT people from the islands were self-employed. So there's there's already a, a, a built-in resilience amongst some of those people because they're running their own business. They have an understanding of the business world and some of the needs that, that their, um, their customers have and their clients. But the, the geography of that means that, you know, you're much more reliant on internet connections or making sure that there's, um, you know, access to services on, on the islands rather than direct employment. Mm -hmm. So I think that's, that's some new information. Similarly with unemployed, uh, we've asked some questions about uh, unemployment rates and the, the national average pre-COVID was 3.5%. Um, for all LGBT people, the average is 10%. So we're more than double the national average in terms of, of unemployment rates. Um, but it's, it's heavier amongst certain communities. So people who live in rural areas, it's 15% unemployed. Uh, the age 20 to 29 uh, is 12.5%. And people who identify as queer, it was 20%. So your, your gender identity and your sexual identity in this research seems to have an impact on the level of employment that you have as well. Hmm. Um, so that's at the end of this week. So uh, that's when the podcast comes up. So I'll make sure to share the link. <laughs> yes, please do. Please do. I mean, some of the, the most interesting stuff is around mental health, though. And I think you were, you've you been talking about that in a couple of your, your episodes. And the, the, the mental health challenges are, are significant. Um, we ask people to rate their mental health at its worst during the, the health crisis on a scale of one to five, one being uh, very mm -hmm. poor, five being excellent. And all LGBT people this, uh, with 63% would rate their mental health as either poor or very poor, the one or two score at the bottom. Uh, and that only, that only increased slightly marginally you know, by the, the time the lockdown had, had improved. So I think there there are significant challenges, and there's there's challenges amongst the community. You know, it's it's often a homogenous group of people that we talk about the LGBT community, mm -hmm. but actually, you know, bisexual and pansexual people, it was seventy three percent would rate their their mental health as worse. Uh, seventy nine percent amongst queer people, seventy four percent aged under thirty. So you can see that as a significant impact uh, on on that age group, and, and most interestingly, it, it was the over fifties who we might have thought. And, and I would admit I made this assumption over 50s, uh, you know, maybe shielding category, uh -huh. um, maybe less family or friends around would be at a, a much greater disadvantage of social isolation and loneliness. Uh -huh. The challenges that, you know, and this is about them rating their own mental health, uh, was only 39%. Now, it's still a significant number, more than a third but it's almost half the rate of the LGBT population as a whole. Okay. So okay. The, the older population, despite what we may think, have a much greater resilience in their mental health. Um, their, Sorry, this data would suggest anyway. Off you go. Sorry, I've got a pit that's dis disrupting. <laughs> <laughs> They're interested in their stats, that's why. Uh, no, it's just listening. No, no that's, that's really interesting. And I think you, what, what you're saying there is actually really interesting because people think there's a homogenous LGBT community, but actually... Um, HBT community overlaps mm -hmm. <laughs> a lot. There's elderly, uh, uh, older people from LGBT community that have a very distinct experience. We have uh, like people from uh, much younger generations who yeah. have, have a new experience of this. And obviously, the experience of lockdown has been way different. And then, uh, well, I mean, this is obviously what uh, we're really interested about at FCE is where uh, when in, it is intersectional, we actually we understand a bit more about the bigger world when we, we start to st stop to look as thing as homogenous as just one big block. So yeah. that, that's really interesting. So definitely, we uh, is there a name for the research? Uh, is, is there? A we have um, yeah. So I mean, the the, the report, the, the program has been called Rainbow Responders. That's the, okay. the the full program that was funded through the National Lottery. 
Um, the, rece the research that will be out, sorry, it's, it's called the Community Matters Research. Community Matters. So the Community Matters Research will be coming out soon. So you'll be able to get that from the pinksaltar.com website. There will okay. be a Rainbow Responders and Community Matters link there to be able to get all the, the information. Okay. So let's talk a bit about that. So uh, have you seen uh, examples of uh, groups that uh, not necessarily, uh, you would not expect to work necessarily together, but have actually during this time, during COVID, to actually start to, to cross the boundaries of what would have seen as homogenous or uh, necessarily a siloed even sometimes. Uh, so any examples you, you can think of? Or, or is that? Um, yeah, well, I mean, the, there's examples within our own remit, actually. We, we've been doing a lot of work with uh, LGBT Unity, who's the Asylum Seeker Project in, in Glasgow, um, making sure that, you know, that, that there's a huge demand uh, amongst that community. They have about uh, 160, 170 members um, that are primarily based in Glasgow, but it's spread all over the country um, and and they you know they're often many of them are in immigration status well section 4 or section 98 status it's called which basically means that you get accommodation while you wait on your decision on, on your asylum uh, application but those individuals are, are being housed um, because there's no facility in, in Glasgow they're being housed in B&Bs and temporary accommodation hotels so the accommodation costs are paid for by the government um, but they get very little other money mm -hmm. to live off. You know, the, the food is not necessarily culturally appropriate. Um, it's provided to them free of charge whether they want it or not. There's there's a meal that they can they can access through the services. Um, but apart from that, the government have absolutely no other uh, obligations to, to fund them whatsoever. So that means they're completely cut off. So how does somebody contact, you know, their relatives if they don't have a mobile phone, if they don't have credit for that mobile phone, mm -hmm. if they don't have access to the internet through the B&B that they're maybe staying at? If they can't see some of the other people that are part of their support network, their, their bubble, if they can't access some of the services they would maybe normally get. You know, imagine being an asylum seeker coming to this country for a new, better life, and you're sitting locked up in a a B and B in Glasgow with no friends or family uh, that that you know of, you know, and, and no access to be able to to, to try and get in touch with th those people either. So we've been trying to provide you know laptops where we can, mobile devices, top ups, as well as just the basics and um, care packs, you know, sanitary products, mm -hmm. food vouchers, just to keep people going. Uh, and there's a there's a huge demand, a, a demand that far outstrips. The funding that we have or that other agencies have that um mm -hmm. you know is, is part of the research we've been saying we really need to focus on 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 some of those organizations and it's similar for um disabled people uh, for gaelic speakers we, we've identified a number of gaps for gaelic speakers in the, in the report for black and ethnic minority communities you know there just isn't very many support services out there at all that, that focus or are run by or or know the, the real needs of those communities. And that's that's a real frustration and, and it's a significant gap that people need to address. Mm. We discuss the food situation where, um, you know, the asylum seekers might just get given a meal and they don't, it's not appropriate to what they're used to eating and everything. Have they been able to like, have some of them just not like eat? kind of thing because of what's been given to them you know or do they try and find service that have they been able to find services like yourself or other people that are close by to sort of help and let the government sort of see look you need to sort this issue or you just can't give them a meal and just accept it kind of thing yeah, so I, I know that there's um, a, a lot of the asylum seekers, um, certainly from LGBT unity, are based in Glasgow. So we're, so we're talking a lot about the, the services that are provided there. But I know there are a number of MPs and MSPs that pressure the government con consistently to provide better facilities. Um, the LGBT unity group that, that we work with, um, the, the lady, uh, Mercy Baguma, who sadly died during, during lockdown with her, her, her wee toddler beside her, she was a member of that that group and and the, the organization had lost two other members during during the lockdown period as well and i just think you know as a country we should be doing a lot more to look after people like that that have come to to scotland for a much better life um than we than we currently do and and that means that scotland has to get 
get organised. Yes, we may not have the powers over immigration, but where we have people here, surely it's our ethical, moral ob obligation to look after them and make sure they have the absolute essentials to get through every day. You know, and that means a safe place to stay. It means uh, access to food and water. And, and surely, in, in this day and age, access to digital services, especially when they're being expected to stay in the house and then adhere to lockdown rules. And so short term, you know, low value funding for organisations like LGBT Unity and others um, just doesn't cut it. It's, it's not enough. And, and people are reducing down what they eat, not going out, you know, severe impact on their mental health. And, and, and that just stores up issues for the future if they're able to get through. Mm -hmm. That's that communication by something that we we've seen happen. It's not just um, how you call it. It's not someone who's uh, super internet savvy whatsoever. It's it, there's all kinds of levels of it. There's not being able to afford the the device to start with, not being able to afford the, the, the provider, the data whatsoever, able to use it, <laughs> and then. On top of that, once you manage to get there, uh, have information in a way that you can actually make some practical use of. Uh, so might it be might it be translated, or might it be to be uh, relevant to your situation? Yep, and, and it's it, you know it's 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 things like you know even PPE. You know we've we've all had to go out and start to buy face masks. Um, if you only have three pounds a day um, from the government to live off, where do you go and buy a packet of? Uh, face masks to do you for a week you know that's that's most of the money that you have for one or two days to just buy the packet of masks so hand sanitizer you know all of that stuff is is now essential for our daily lives and yet we've got a group of of individuals here who don't have access to that and and you know i can just speak about the experiences we have of of the 150 or so lgbt asylum seekers there are thousands more like that that you know we should step up as a country to to make sure they have the services that we all take for granted and the access to those services, I think. So what 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 do you think is of help? So so I'm starting to feel saying that you you're saying that the short term helps right now, but it's it's not practical for organization. So what what, what do you think would yeah uh, just be a bit better in this situation? I, you know, I think there has to be you know a root and branch review of of, of exactly how uh, some of these services have, have been provided and where the gaps are. I think government has to to, to listen to some of these grassroots organisations that are there on the, ground, on the ground trying to deliver these services every day. There has to be a longer term funding for some of these bodies. Um, uh, and some of them are, are kind of intermediary organisations, you know, and they talk to the government regularly about policy change or, or um, particular areas of, of legislative change. But actually, there's a duty on, on the government, surely, to provide the absolute basic essentials for all its citizens. And, and that's the type of services that we want to be funded long term, you know, not just a, a, a six month project, not just even a, a one year project. There's a consistent need here and we need to, to address that head on. That can't be left to private funders all the time. It can't be left to the lottery organisations or, or you know, private trusts because eventually those trusts, the, the money dries up. You know, and we're seeing that through uh, through the National Lottery just now. Play uh, on, on the lottery has decreased. So there's a, a decreasing value coming forward to third sector organisations and community groups. Um, that, as far as I'm concerned, that those basic needs and those hardship needs still exist. And yet we're being forced to look at, you know, longer term plans for, for six months, uh, you know, ahead when people can't feed, uh, feed themselves today. You know, I, I can't look at a service that's going to start in six months' time when we've got service users who urgently need help today. Mm -hmm. So the, I mean, the second lockdown, it's not really the second lockdown. It's more like the winter lockdown, I guess. Mm -hmm. where that's that's something that's a big worry for a lot of folks. So is that is that uh, something that you're facing as well? We, um, yeah, absolutely. So I think, as, as I said, we have been really successful in, in bringing in uh, you know, a significant amount of cash over the period, which is great, but access to those funds has significantly diminished now. Um, I don't see the same level of urgency 
uh, when it comes to funding third, third sector organisations to get out there and, and do some of this work than there was back in March and April. Now, yes, the situation is slightly different, but people are still struggling. And I think where they struggle and where we've got evidence that we can provide practical solutions to help, mm -hmm. surely that's worth investing in. Definite. Um, how, how, how would you go about it, like if people wanted to get involved with your group, you know, and think about ways in helping you in either any way that they can? Um, so things are obviously very different because of COVID right now and local restrictions will determine whether or not we can meet in person. Um, but we're still looking for, for volunteers. We always have a call out for, for volunteers generally. Um, the website is probably the best place to start. So you can see a bit more about our, our work there. You can see some of the projects that we're, we're running just now. And, and then I guess, uh, you know, whatever skills you've got, we're, we're keen to hear from you. So drop us an email. Uh, the address info at pinksoftware.com is, is a kind of jet general generic email address and, and website um, address for for information so get across drop us some details and and we'll definitely pick you up on uh, whatever skills you can you can provide and you can donate to, some time to us yes that sounds good and you also have a youtube channel you mentioned yes okay. youtube channel uh youtube at pink Saltar. Just search for us there and you'll be able to see all of our previous videos and uh, some of the work that we've been doing over the lockdown that includes where well, we had a pink pride day we had uh, some interviews on the history of pride we've got lots and lots and lots of content on there for you to to see and, do, and watch okay so our, our task i think lisa and i will be to spread the word and uh, make sure that people actually uh, think about how, how do we make things a bit more sustainable uh, over winter in the next few months and I think that's a good discussion to have definitely. Yeah and, and I have to say you know um, the the Equalities Forum that the FCE have been running you know that's been a key topic in, in the last couple of meetings is, is all of our agencies talking together and trying to learn from each other share challenges but also you know share ideas on how we can address some of these because as you say you know lots of these challenges are are, are not specific to one sector they're intersectional and um, they're right across the community so we have to work together and we have to find new ways of, of working innovative ways of working to make sure that people get the, the support that they desperately need in a in a, a changing and ever-changing funding landscape where where funds are much much harder to, to get access to okay we got a plan we're gonna spread the word <laughs> that <sounds> fantastic good. <laughs> excellent thank you so much for your time not at all thank you for having me and uh, i want to just give a wee shout out to all of our fantastic volunteers that did help over the summer of which uh, you elric uh, and lewis were, were members helping us get the food packs out there sure. helping us get all of our, um, our hardship relief out to fifers uh, and across other parts of the country as well and hopefully we'll have our, our connections group which runs every tuesday at the cowden beef uh, at the maxwell center in cowden beef up and running again in a face-to-face -face format as soon as it's safe to do oh excellent so oh, that sounds good. That sounds really good. Okay, we share all these links uh, at the end of the video to everyone, so we, everyone can join. So that's Thanks all for having day. me. Thanks so much. All Thanks for coming. Out there. <laughs> <laughs> Bye.